So most people, I'm sure in this, in this sophisticated London audience, will have seen Dr. Strangelove. And uh, there was a kind of legend that, that Kissinger was partly the inspiration for Peter Sellers' character in that movie, the, the German-accented uh, theorist of nuclear uh, war. But, but that's not right. Um, it, it's actually a kind of amalgam of Hermann Kahn and, and Werner von Braun, not Kissinger. Because if you look at Dr. Strangelove, he's, a, he's clearly a former Nazi uh, and a rocket scientist. Kissinger is a refugee and an expert by the early 1950s in, well, your special subject, the defeat of Napoleon, which is what he writes his doctoral dissertation about, finds himself suddenly drawn into the world of nuclear strategy by happenstance, really. I think it was because Harvard wouldn't give him a tenured professorship. He didn't want to go to Chicago. And he got offered a job at the Council on Foreign Relations to act as rapporteur for a committee that was thinking about US nuclear strategy. And he pretty quickly took over that role and turned, and turned it into his book. I mean, he turned the, the minutes, as it were, of the meetings into the raw material for a book that made him famous. Now, what this book argues uh, does, as you rightly say, at first blush sound crazy. Uh, it argues that there should be an option to wage a limited nuclear war because at this point in US history, it's the Eisenhower era, you only have two options if the Russians take aggressive action. Give in, blow the world up. That's the choice. And Eisenhower had set this rather deliberately up as a binary uh, uh, set of alternatives uh, because he felt that anything else would let the military run riot as they somewhat had under Truman. Kissinger's point was, this is nuts. We'll never, ever stand up to the Russians if our only sanction is Armageddon. We'll just end up giving in to them because nothing will be worth the threat of massive retaliation. So in that sense, the book starts to, to become a little less crazy. Uh, it argues that there ought to be an option if the Russians, for example, use massive conventional forces in Europe to use what became known as battlefield nuclear weapons uh, to check their advance. Otherwise, you lose all of Europe because you just don't have the conventional forces to resist the Red Army. Two interesting points. One, Kissinger later changed his mind about this. Not long after, actually, said, come to think of it, maybe that would be pretty hard to pull off a limited nuclear war that wouldn't escalate. But secondly, and crucially, even although he rode back, the theory became central to NATO strategy for the rest of the Cold War. I mean, there were battlefield nuclear weapons. They became a crucial part of both superpowers' arsenals. And you don't build weapons like that if you don't have a theory of limited nuclear war. So although it never happened, uh, it could have happened, and it was certainly a strategic option for the rest of the Cold War. How did he get on with the Kennedy administration? Now, Kissinger had a very interesting relationship with the Kennedy family. He became involved in politics as an advisor to a Kennedy opponent, a Republican, playboy, billionaire, who wasn't terribly intellectually profound. Uh, nobody like that could ever run for the Republican <laughs> nomination. <laughs> Today, of course, <laughs> oh, wait. <laughs> I, Nelson Rockefeller was no, no Donald Trump, though, and, and, and I don't mean to imply that he was. He was nevertheless somebody who preferred to buy an author than to read a book. And so <laughs> rather than trouble himself with reading nuclear weapons and foreign policy, he hired Kissinger to be a foreign policy advisor. And Kissinger and he clicked. I think Kissinger loved the idea of this aristocratic figure with his massive art collection and multiple lovely houses. Uh, and also, N Nelson Rockefeller admired Kissinger's intellect and saw that he, in fact, was a pretty shrewd, strategic thinker. But Rockefeller kept losing. I mean, he just lost every time. Three out of three bids for the Republican nomination end in failure. And each time he loses, Kissinger is kind of gunned for hire as a strategic thinker. Well, John F. Kennedy liked hiring Harvard professors. In fact, the administration in 60-61 is largely staffed with people that he's rounded up in Harvard Yard. Uh, and Kissinger is approached by Kennedy uh, before he's even won the election and uh, invited to lunch, and Kennedy lays on the charm. Kissinger ends up in the Kennedy administration, admittedly as a pretty small player, trying to fathom this new and unfamiliar world of, of White House politics. And boy, is it an unfamiliar world. Apart from anything else, you've got the president 
bonking everything that moves <laughs> upstairs uh, while people are trying to manage the most dangerous moments of the Cold War downstairs. I mean, this is kind of unfamiliar for a, a guy from small town Germany uh, who's, who's, you know, he's seen some stuff in the war, but this is, this is a whole different, I nearly called it a ball game. <laughs> Which brings us on to, um, to Vietnam um, and your discovery of the 1965 uh, diary and uh, tell, tell us a bit about um, the way in which Kissinger's mind evolves with regard to the uh, increasing American involvement in Vietnam. Well, you all know, Andrew, the feeling of excitement when you get a golden document, something that is absolutely quotable and quotable and, and really can make a book. When I found the 1965 diary of a trip to Vietnam, I remember feeling enormous excitement. And it got only more exciting as I read. Unlike many professors who comment uh, on foreign policy matters, Kissinger wanted to get out of his Harvard study and go and see what the hell was going on. This is coming already by 65, the biggest issue facing the United States. Uh, and Kissinger, who, remember, had been in the military, uh, didn't shirk from going to the front line. Uh, he went to Saigon as an advisor to the US ambassador in South Vietnam, but pretty quickly got out of the city and started to see for himself what was happening. And to me, the impressive thing is how quickly, already in 1965, he realizes the whole thing is a complete disaster. And it's a disaster for two reasons. One, there's this horrific, ungainly American bureaucracy running amok with five different agencies all engaged in what would have been, uh, a few decades later, PowerPoint presentations about how well they're doing. Uh, and at the same time, uh, there are, is a, an incredibly corrupt government in Saigon, which is clearly incapable of existing on its own. He comes back and essentially tells his colleagues at Harvard, we have to find a diplomatic way out of this. And he begins working intensively on that problem. It really takes over. Uh, he ends up in secret negotiations, trying to start conversations with the North Vietnamese in Paris in 1967. Uh, works extremely hard to try and get a breakthrough, thinks he's getting close, uh, and learns a really valuable lesson about diplomacy because he's really made a fool of by the North Vietnamese representative in Paris. The, the, the crucial point to understand about Vietnam in the late 1960s, and this is often forgotten, is that the North Vietnamese had no intention of reaching a diplomatic settlement with the United States. They thought they were going to win. And so they play footsie with Johnson and later on uh, with Nixon, while all the time planning military victory. This is very true in 67. They're going through this whole charade of, well, maybe we'll take the call, maybe we'll have the meeting, while at the same time planning the Tet Offensive, which they launch the next year. So this is a pretty interesting lesson for uh, Kissinger in the dark art of diplomacy. And you do also point out that there was another reason why he wanted to go to Paris in 1967 and 68. Oh, well, I'm really, I'm glad you brought that up because it's a reminder, I learned something about being a historian doing this. Uh, it, it's a reminder that you can't find everything in the documents. There, there are things that you can only know if they're vouchsafed to you. I thought I had written a, a pretty good chapter on this 1967 episode. And indeed, I thought it was one of the best in the book. And then I went and had dinner at the Kissingers, having, I thought, finished the book. This is before I got the all the extra documents. And as I was preparing to sit down, uh, Nancy Kissinger said, and she was clearly not going to stay for dinner, but she wanted to say something. Neil, why do you think Henry was really spending so much time in Paris in 1967? <laughs> and this is sort of a terrible moment for a story because you realize that you've completely missed something. And I had completely missed something because it wasn't there in the written record at all. He was there because she was there. Uh, she had been uh, working on her uh, doctoral dissertation uh, on interwar France at the Sorbonne. So it turned out that one reason Kissinger didn't really mind being led down the garden path by the North Vietnamese was he was quite happy to spend the whole summer in Paris seeing Nancy Kissinger as she became, Nancy McGuinness as she was then, with whom he'd been having a relationship since 1964, since the Republican National Convention in San Francisco uh, where they had met. That relationship remained secret 
It was not reported on in the press until the early 1970s. And I think the main reason for keeping it so private was that he'd only got divorced shortly before 1964. He had two very young children, and he just didn't want it out there. So this was a salutary reminder that one can find as much as possible from serious and scrupulous archival research. But there are things you can only find out if people actually tell you. Uh, and this is something you didn't have with Napoleon. <laughs> um, well, that brings us on to 1968 and the whole question of Richard Nixon. Uh, what Nixon saw in him, why Nixon turned to him, what he thought of Nixon at the beginning is fascinating. Your, the, your description of, of the relationship between these two men, which obviously is going to be a key uh, aspect of volume two, the kernel of it is very much there in volume one. So would you like to talk a bit about that? Well, I was sure I was going to be able to find the origin of their relationship and, and reveal that it began much earlier than anyone had realised. And I was especially sure when I discovered that the Professor Elliot I mentioned earlier had been a Nixon advisor and, in fact, had got close to Richard Nixon in the 1950s when, when Nixon was a pretty unknown congressman. So I thought, ah! There has to be a moment when these two men met. And I'm going to show that the relationship and therefore had deep roots. No. In fact, despite the Elliott connection, they didn't meet until the end of 1967. And this was partly because Kissinger avoided Nixon. What I hadn't fully appreciated until I did the book was that Kissinger, in common with most people uh, at Harvard, or for that matter in New York, loathed Nixon, or as Arthur Schlesinger put it, loathed Nixon. <laughs> and so when Nixon reached out to Kissinger in 1960, after Rockefeller had lost the nomination, Kissinger invented a trip to Japan to avoid taking the meeting. Now, we all try to avoid people we don't want to meet, but to go to Japan <laughs> to avoid someone suggests you really, really, really do not want to meet them. And, and that meant that there was this curious non-relationship at the heart of Volume 1, a non-relationship that only finally became a relationship at a cocktail party in New York in late 1967, a very awkward meeting between the two. Kissinger had been rude about Nixon publicly. He'd said he was unfit to be president. And there they were, one of those somewhat awkward occasions. And lo and behold, it's the socially inept Nixon who breaks the ice. Uh, how does he do it? I already told you this, by telling the professor that he'd read one of his books. <laughs> and, and indeed he had, because I, I was able to show in my research that Nixon had read Nuclear Weapons and Foreign Policy. He'd probably read much else that Kissinger wrote. Uh, and so the odd thing about the relationship is that it turned out not to be personal. It turned out to be purely intellectual. And Nixon read Kissinger and admired him. And despite all the rebuffs, uh, he finally ends up offering this man a job. There are all kinds of theories about why that came about, incidentally, some of them of enormously complex and conspiratorial detail. I think, fundamentally, it was an intellectual affinity that Nixon was the first to spot. And in the second volume, would you like to give us a little preliminary view about... Uh, I mean, obviously, the second volume is likely to be much more controversial than the first. You've got Chile and Cambodia and all the other great uh, issues. Uh, what, um, how far are you through the research, the writing, and, and how are your thoughts coalescing? Well, I'm probably about 60%, maybe 65% of the way through getting the stuff. I'm <coughs> more like 10% through processing it. And I've written an introduction which I'll almost certainly discard, but which is there just to help me organise my thoughts. And, and, and that's about as much as I can say, because I, I really haven't made up my mind. I have no idea what the subtitle will be. I guess it won't be controversial if I call it Dr. Evil. Uh, <laughs> I, I think that the, the challenge, and it's hard to com communicate to people who haven't been through this process of, of immersing yourself in, in thousands, tens of thousands of pages of material, is that you, you make up your mind about something at quite a late stage in the process, once you've gathered all the material and once you've read it all through in... I'm, in my case, I read it all in chronological order, and then I sort of build chapters sorry, how, rather laboriously. You, you read it all in chronological order? Yeah. How, how, sorry, how on earth do you do that? Well, it's, a slightly, um, it's slightly nerdy. Can I be nerdy for a second? Please. Um, I, I set out to try and do this in a different way from the way I'd done previous books by taking advantage of technology. So although there's 
tens of thousands of pages of stuff. Uh, it's, in a, it's in a database. Uh, I can see the facsimile of every document. Uh, my wonderful research assistant, Jason, was going around all these archives while I was teaching and just taking pictures of page after page after page. Uh, and we've also digitized them so that there's uh, a, a searchable text uh, also there in the database. And my rather old-fashioned way of working is when I finally conclude there is no more stuff or we're into diminishing returns and any more stuff is going to be of marginal use, I just sit down and I plod through it. And I try and relive the life day by day and sometimes hour by hour on the basis of what I've got. And I have to say, I do find it at one, time, at one and the same time incredibly tedious <laughs> and incredibly exciting because there are moments of tedium, there are dull letters, there are letters that get nowhere, there are awful articles that you wish you didn't have to plow through. But as you read through and relive the life, with the archives all coming together, with all the different pieces of the jigsaw suddenly arranged in line, that is the moment when you see what actually happened. Ranker's great phase, phrase, wie es eigentlich gewesen. So volume two is miles from that point of, of real understanding. Uh, and that's why if you want to ask me questions about post December 1968, that all I can offer you will be lame hypotheses. Uh, that's really all I've got at this point.